So bringing it home for us today is a, a personal hero of mine, a, a man of amazing accomplishments. Doug Carnine is a professor emeritus at the University of Oregon where he did research, taught, and advocated all with a focus on improving the education of vulnerable children, the poor, students with disabilities, English language learners, and children of color. His accomplishments include 100 plus scholarly publications, numerous lectures presented around the world, and receiving the University of Oregon Ersted Award for Outstanding University Teaching and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Council for Exceptional Children. He has served as an advisor to the Assistant Secretary in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services and received a presidential appointment to the National Institute for Literacy, which was confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Simultaneously, so I mean, how can there be a simultaneously? Um, simultaneously, over a 50-year period, he developed a meditation and kindness practice, eventually becoming a Buddhist lay minister, working in hospice and with prisoners. He translated this 50 years of work into a mindful kindness project that includes two books, Saint Badass, Transcendence in Tucker Max Hell, and How Love Wins, The Power of Mindful Kindness, and a related website, feedkindness.com. Doug's call to kindness seems particularly relevant in today's complex and hard-edged world. Doug? Um, so what I'd like you to do now is, why don't you stretch in some way, maybe stand up. While you're doing that, I want you to think of a memorable kindness that you either received or gave. I want you to take a minute to think about the feeling that you had in association with that kindness. Those positive feelings came from oxytocin, dopamine, and other neurotransmitters surging through your body in response to kindness. You can sit down. Research shows that being kinder leads to more happiness, better health, longer lives, and stronger loving relationships. In one study, wounds literally heal faster in members of a couple who were kinder to each other. So the, the researchers actually put a wound on the arm of the individuals. And the couples who were kind to each other, the wounds literally healed faster. One researcher, said, one researcher said, the benefits of kindness may be more important than what you think, more so than regular physical activity and following a nutritious diet. So mindfulness also has benefits, but it's quite popular and we hear a lot about it. It means that we're aware of what's going on right in front of us without being judgmental. We can shift our attention away from distracting and upsetting thoughts about the past or future. Instead, we can pay attention to how best we can be kind. Without mindfulness, our, baby, our biases and self-absorption often prevent us from knowing how to be genuinely kind. For example, a Boy Scout told his Scoutmaster that he had been kind by helping an elder lady cross the street. The scoutmaster agreed the action had been kind, but added that it seemed a little trivial. The Boy Scout protested, no, it wasn't easy at all. She did not want to cross the street. <laughs> That's how we impose our sense of what's good to do on others. Since retirement, personal experiences have brought alive the scientific findings about the power of kindness. For example, in 2010, I was a hospice volunteer with Jeremy. He was 35 years old with advanced ALS. He'd lost 60 pounds of muscle mass in the past six months. He had no use of his body below his neck. His earlier life had not been easy. He ran away from home at age 13 in disgust over the behavior of his mother. His wife broke off their marriage because of his study of yoga and later prohibited his 11-year-old daughter from visiting him while he was on his deathbed. Though near death, Jeremy reached out to others in kindness by talking about how blessed his life was. His kindness drew visitors to his bedside. Another hospice volunteer asked to spend time with Jeremy, basking in his contentment and kindness, as did the employees of the care center who would spend their breaks sitting by his bedside. Jerry Jeremy told me he was like a drop of water in a river. When the river came to a waterfall, many drops separated and he was born. As the drops cascaded down, each drop acted as a prism, sending out light according to the nature of the drop. Some were white, 
some brown and some black. The water drop returning to the river below signified Jeremy's death. He said, as long as I live, I want to be a positive force, a life full of love for my people, which is everyone. It does not make any difference what kind of water drop you are. You could be any shape, any size, or any color. I am a very blessed individual to have had so much time to be able to feel and smell, to be able to run and love and laugh and hurt. When convicted murderer Roy Tester wrote me about Buddhist practice in prison, I remembered Jerry's kindness and suggested that Roy and I start a mindful kindness partnership to benefit prisoners and guards. Kindness had been in short supply in Roy's life. As a child, his father and friends of his father sexually abused him with the full knowledge of his mother. Roy ended up murdering his parents. He will spend the rest of his life in the notorious Tucker Maximum Security Prison described in the fact-based Robert Redford movie Brubaker with its telephone torture machine and 200 unmarked graves of prisoners. Having been repeatedly molested as a child, Roy had a deep hatred toward child molesters. Yet, after part of our mindful kindness partnership, he wrote this to me, quote, Much as I used to hate child molesters called chomos in prison, one time the guards put one in with us. When I realized what was up, everything went deadly quiet. I knew these two guys were fixing to pop more holes than a sieve in this little geeky, nerd-looking dude and slice him up. So I got off my bed and went straight to the dude. When I got to his face, I said, you sick, como, maggot, piece of blankety-blank, I'm going to kill your blankety-blank ass, and slapped him and said under my breath, run for the door, they're going to kill you. They locked me up for assaulting him, but I didn't care because those two killers would have killed him. Roy, sexually molested as a child, ended up in the hole for 30 days, saving the life of a child molester. A few other men convicted of murder joined our partnership, and one by one, they used mindful kindness to turn their lives around. You can hear these men tell their own stories in our book, St. Badass, Personal Transcendence in Tucker Max Hell. The kind habits needed for a loving marriage will also enrich our relationships with our children, relatives, friends. But what about the workplace? Is it worthwhile to be more mindfully kind at work? In Adam Grant's research on corporations, he identified people as belonging to one of four types. Doormats, you let people walk all over you. Takers, who only concern is their own advantage. Matchers, who are always keeping score. I helped him once, he's got to help me or I won't help him again. And finally, the sustainable givers who are kind. Of the four types, the kind, sustainable givers, quote, are usually the most successful people in business. They may also be the happiest. Givers experience more meaning in their work than takers or matchers, end quote. A large experimental study in a Spanish corporation found that the givers of kindness were more satisfied with their lives and their jobs. Receivers of kindness in the corporation became happier and did three times as many kind acts as did the control group. Sadly, only 8% of the workers in this country see themselves as kind givers. Quote, most people think it's safer to operate like a taker or a matcher at work. Sustainable givers, they think, are chumps who will fall behind in the game of life. 
During my 35-year career at the University of Oregon, as Marshall said, I focused on improving education with children. Now retired, most of my volunteer work focuses on vulnerable adults like Roy. As our country becomes increasingly diverse and the gap between rich and poor widens, we need more people at all levels of government and industry to value kindness, particularly kindness for those who have the greatest needs. For example, many adults, such as Roy, suffer from trauma caused by an abusive or neglectful childhood. One of my volunteer roles is serving as president of the board for the nonprofit Generation PMTO that gives abusing and neglecting parents skills that allow them to reunite with their children. Hundreds of counselors are applying Generation PMTO scientific findings around the world to decrease child abuse. Abusive parents are learning to replace violence and anger with parenting skills such as encouraging positive behavior, family problem solving, positive, positive involvement, limit setting, and monitoring. Both the parents and the children benefit. Still less than 1% of the children who would benefit from this training are receiving it. If the parents of my incarcerated friends in St. Badass had those skills, most of these men would not be in prison today and their victims would still be alive. I will be signing copies of my two books when I finish, with the profits from the sale of those books being donated to Generation PMTO. I'm going to end with an inspiring story of an unlikely topic, unrequited love between a goat and a dog. <laughs> they regularly played together. After the two played together, the dog had a 48% increase in oxytocin, the love hormone. This moderate change in oxytocin suggested the dog viewed the goat as a friend. More striking was the goat's reaction to the dog. The goat had a 210% increase in oxytocin. Evidently, the goat was in love with the dog. Providing and proving that love can still blaze up in those of us, like Marshall and I, who are old goats. <laughs>